Good evening, everyone. I'd like to take the opportunity to share with you some ideas that are shared on Shabbos HaGadol that I think can change not only your Seder, but can change really very significant aspects in our lives. I want to deal with the section of the Haggadah, Ram Gamil Hayomer, Ram Gamil used to say. I hope that to send around the PDF along with the file. And if not, then just open up Haggadah so that you can follow me. It's right after the Dayenu, towards the end of the Magid part, very close to the second cup of wine and the eating of matzah and mar and shulchanach and the meal. We just had the whole section of saying over the story of Egypt, the exodus of Egypt, then telling over Dayenu, singing that amazing song Dayenu. The reason that it's amazing is because what we're saying is Dayenu would have been enough that any one of the things that if God would have done for us would have been enough for us to make an entire holiday of Passover. But God didn't do one thing. He did so many, all of those things, 15 of those things how much I'm obligated to thank him and to praise him. Then Rabbi Gamliel tells us, whoa, before you finish, make sure you say these three things. Anybody who hasn't said these three things has not fulfilled their obligation. And what are these three things? Pesach, Matzah, and Mara. And then he goes on to explain what's Pesach. Pesach is because God passed over Thousands and he saved us. Therefore, we eat the carbon Pesach, we eat the Paschal lamb as a reminder of that miracle of God saving the Jewish people. Matzah, Zushan Ochlem, what do we eat the matzah for? Because we didn't have enough time to bake bread, so we took the dough out and the dough baked into, without, without rising, and it baked into, into matzahs. Mara, because they embittered our lives. Things were terrible for us. Then, Rabbi Gamliel says, Behold, over door in every generation, a person is obligated to see himself as if he left Mitzrayim, as if he left Egypt. And then the Baal HaGadah says, Lefikach, therefore, Anachnu Chayov, and we are obligated. And he uses his nine different languages of singing praise to Hashem. Because God has turned our slavery into freedom, our sorrow into joy, our mourning into celebration, our darkness into light, and our servitude into redemption. And therefore, we'll sing a Shira Chadosha, a new song in front of him, Hallelujah. It's a beautiful section. Then we go on to sing Hallel, and then make a bracha on the Agada and drink the next cup of wine, the second cup of wine. And we finish this section of the Agada. But every single part of this is problematic to me. Let's start from the very beginning. Rabbi Gamliel says, Anybody who hasn't said three things, said three things? You could say them from today till tomorrow, till the cows come home. Saying them is not going to do anything. You haven't fulfilled your obligation. You have to eat them. You have to eat the matzah. You have to eat the mar. You have to eat it with the carbon pesa, with the pesca lamb. And if nowadays you can't eat the pesca lamb, then tell over, say over the sacrifice. And that's like you've sacrificed the pesca lamb. But you can't get away without eating. You can't just talk about it. You have to do it. What is Rabbi Gamliel saying to us? Koshalo Omar. Anybody who hasn't said this is as if he hasn't fulfilled his obligation. Why these three things? What about anybody who hasn't said the four languages of Gula of redemption and reminded themselves that there's four stages of getting closer to God? Anybody who hasn't talked about the dipping, and the dipping is really an indication or remembrance of the of the dipping of the coat of Joseph into the blood. Anybody who hasn't reclined, hasn't spoken about reclining at the Seder, hasn't explained that mitzvah of reclining at the Seder, hasn't fulfilled his obligation of becoming a, a ben Choran, a free person. There's plenty of things that we have to do and we have to say and we have to talk about. Why these three things? Why Pesach, Matzah, and Mar? And what does it mean you haven't fulfilled your obligation? If you haven't said them, you haven't fulfilled your obligation. What obligation? 
So some of our rabbis say that it's the obligation of these three things. In other words, you haven't fully eaten matzah if you don't understand what matzah is. You haven't fully eaten marah if you don't understand what marah is. You haven't fully fulfilled the mitzvah of carbon pesah, of paschal lamb, until you understand what it is. There are other rabbis that say that you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah of sipur yitzias mitzrayim, of telling over the exodus, the story of the exodus of Egypt. This is a critical component of telling over the story of the exodus of Egypt. I understand that once you tell me that the more a person tells over the story of the Exodus of Egypt, the better they are, the better it is. So you're telling me that there is no size limitation on the midst of telling over the story. But yeah, there is a minimum, and perhaps it's telling me what the minimum is. The minimum is Pesach Matzah Mar. But what's the, what is it? Just three words? Pesach Matzah Mar? Or is it Pesach with its explanation? Matzah with its explanation? Mar with its explanation? What exactly does Rabbi Gamliel mean when he says you haven't fulfilled your obligation? What obligation is he talking about? My fourth problem is I don't understand how we can give a reason for Pesach Matzah and Mar. We don't give reasons for mitzvahs because whenever you give a reason for mitzvah, you're never telling the whole story. You're only telling a part of the story. You give a reason for matzah. Matzah is duality. Matzah speaks of freedom and of slavery. If you're going to give a reason that it's got to do with freedom, then you've left out the slavery. If you give a reason that about the slavery, then it's left out the, the freedom. Very often, when we try to give a reason for something, we give an excuse why we don't need to do it. Oh, that, that reason doesn't apply to me. We don't give reasons for mitzvahs. We give them eventually. Our rabbis have, have, have taught us so that we can deepen our connection to the mitzvahs. But at the end of the day, there are no reasons for the mitzvahs. The reasons we do the mitzvahs is because the Rebbe Nishlam commanded us to do the mitzvahs. Why would the Baal Gada explain, why would Rabbi Gamliel explain Pesach Matzah Mar in the way that they explained it when it's just explaining and defining one small part of it and it's leaving out the other aspects of it? Why are we giving Tame and mitzvahs? Why are we giving reasons for the mitzvahs? And why this order? Pesach, matzah, marah. It's really marah, Pesach, matzah. It's really marah that was bitter first. And then we were redeemed. We came out and we had the, the Korban Pesach and, and the matzah. Why are you putting marah at the end? Why not at the beginning? And why is this whole section here? We, as I explained, just sang Dayenu. We just said, God, we need to praise you. We're about to sing Hallel, to sing incredible praises of Hashem, and dumped in the middle of those two songs to God is this dry recitation about Pesach, Matzah, and Mar. I also have to worry why it says, in every generation, a person has to see themselves as if they left Egypt. You know, I had this chus to be in Auschwitz. I stood in the place where they were making selections. I was standing there. Mamish, under my feet was the, was the very place that the stories that I was telling took place. I was standing in the barracks. I was listening to and telling over stories of incredible things that happened. I tried to visualize myself as if I was there. It was very difficult for me because I have no context to put it in. I've never suffered that way. I've never been shouted at. I've never been shot at. I've never had that kind of experience. There was no way for me to relate to it. That was 75 years ago. You're asking me to go back 3,500 years I don't even know what kind of clothes they wore 3,500 years ago with designer togas. Like, I have, just have no idea. How am I supposed to put myself back 3,500 years and to see myself ke'ilu yotzim m'sayim as if I left Egypt? That's not possible. And then the Haggadah says, lefikach, and therefore, we're chayef to sing these praises to Hashem. What do you mean, therefore, we're chayef to sing these praises to Hashem? Therefore what? Th therefore, because Pesach, Matz, and Mara? Therefore, because in every generation, we have to see ourselves as if we left Egypt? Therefore what? Therefore, we have to sing these praises. What does that mean? Lefikach. Therefore, we sing these praises. 
What's going on here? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the difference between Sukkot and Pesach. If you look at Sukkot and all the mitzvahs that we have in Sukkot, and we're saturated with mitzvahs and Sukkot, they're all about a seal, they're all about doing. We take a lulav and esik, we shake the lulav and esik, we sit inside of a sukkah, we draw the water and we pour water on the altar in the temple. It's all about doing. And look at Pesach. Pesach is all about the mouth. Eating, drinking, praising, singing, talking, explaining, telling over stories. The entire observance of Pesach is all about the math. And as a matter of fact, all the major words of Pesach have to do with the math. Pesach. Pe Sach, a mouth that speaks. Paroi, pe, ra, an evil mouth. The way we worked, parach, pe, rach. They sweet talked us, soft talked us into becoming slaves. Moshe Rabbeinu had a deficiency. Where was his deficiency? Kvad pe. He had a difficulty speaking. Why does everything on Pesach center around the math? So let's look at our greatest kayach, our greatest ability. You know, when God created the world on day one, he created heavens and earth. So it was like one for the heaven team, one for the earth team. Day two, God created the rakia. He created the, the firmament. He created one for the heavens. Then he evened it out on day three. He created plants and trees, one for the earth. And then on day four, he created the sun, the moon, the stars, heavens. And then day five, the birds and the fish, earth. Score was even three to three. Our rabbis tell us that if God would have created something on the sixth day that had to do with heavens, the earth would have been insulted. If God would have created something about the earth, then the heavens would have been insulted. What's a God to do? So what did God do? He created something that is both heaven and earth. He created the human being. The human being with a goof and a shaman, the human being with a body and a soul, a human being that's rooted in spirituality, rooted in the heavens, and rooted in gashmas and materialism, rooted in the earth. And that it has both aspects. Score stays even. But what's the connection, the connecting point between the heaven and the earth of a human being? The kaya hadibur, the power of speech. The Torah tells us that when God blew the breath of life into the nostrils of men, the Aramaic translation says that it's ruach mimalolo, that it is the spirit of speech. That's what life is. The ability to be able to take what's inside of us and to bring it out into the world and to connect that with our physical world so that our spiritual world and physical world becomes one, that we create this spiritual reality within our physical world because we can take what's inside of us and bring it out. That's a koach, that's a power of speech. That power of speech no other creature in the world has. Oh, there are creatures that can talk and communicate. Mother bird can say to a child bird, be careful, there's a hunter out there. But she can't do something or say something to the child bird. And then the child bird turns to the mama bird and says to the mama bird, mama bird, I can't believe you did that to me. You've hurt me. And the mama bird look at the child bird and says, oh, sweetie, 
It's just another thing you're going to have to be able to tell your bird therapist when you go to the bird therapy. Birds can't do that. Birds don't have the ability to be able to express themselves that way. Only human beings have that ability. That ability to take what's inside of them and to bring it out into the world. That's the reason why Lashon Hara is so terrible, because Lashon Hara is a sullying of that koach hadibu, of that incredible power of speech. That's why our words have the ability to be able to create Kedusha. We can be Mikadesh something. We can sanctify something. We can elevate its status with our words. Because our words can create a reality. Chayim v'mav is by the Lashon. Life and death is by the, in the hands of the, of the tongue. We can lift up, we can destroy. We can take our insides and connect it to the highest of places, and we can take our insides and connect it to the lowest of places. This, in fact, is the greatest symbol of a Jew. Hakol Kol Yaakov. The voice is the voice of Jacob. We have this incredibly powerful koach which we lost in Mitzrayim. In Egypt, we sunk to the 49th level of impurity to the extent that the angels said, the Egyptians worship idols, the Jews worship idols. Why are you taking the one from away from the other? They're exactly the same. It was hard to even find us. It was hard to even extricate us, to be able to do this fine surgery of removing us from the Egyptians because we had become so similar to them in many of the things that we did. <clears throat> we lost our voices. We lost our ability to be able to express ourselves, to be able to take our insides, to identify what our insides are, and to use them to connect them to God. We lost our words. We lost our voices. We lost our connection to Hashem. If you look carefully, we had no words to say in Egypt. We sighed. Vinitzak. We screamed. Vayizaku. We called out. We cried out. No words. Just sounds. Because we were in Golis Hadibur. Because we were in an exile of our speech, of our koach hadibur. Look what happened to us as soon as we got out and we became free. We crossed over the sea and what's the first thing we did? We found our voices. Oz Yoshir Moshe! We were able to sing this incredible song, which was a reflection of what was going on inside of us. We could take that and bring that out into our world and create this incredible, beautiful connection with God. Six weeks later, we stood at the foot of Mount Sinai and God asked us if we wanted the Torah. And what did we do? We used our words to say, Na'ase v'nishma. It's like a baby's first cry. A baby passes through the birth canal. Our rabbis tell us that when it passes through the birth canal, that soul that had been hovering over the body for, for all those months, teaching Torah to the child, that soul and the body now come together as one. And what's the first thing that we want to hear and we want to see? We want to hear that cry because that cry means that baby has a voice that baby's soul can now express itself and bring itself out into the world you know we talked about a shira chadasha a new song it's incredible that in the book of shoftim in the book of judges we go up and down. We do what's good in the eyes of God. Then we do what's bad in the eyes of God. Then God sends a judge to lead us in war against our enemies. We get lifted up. We're amazing. Then it says we continued to sin in the eyes of God. And then our enemies attacked us. And then we get a new leader. 
helps us do tshuva, beat the enemy, we go back up. Then it says we continue to do that which was evil in the eyes of God and just keeps going on and on and on and on. And you know where this pattern didn't repeat itself? After Devora. After Devora had, she was a judge, great military victory. The Navi tells us, and the Jewish people sinned and went away from God. It didn't say they continued to sin. There was no connection to what happened previously. It was like a brand new start. What happened in the time of Devora that this was now like a brand new start? How did it cut off from the past? We know that there are two ways to do tshuva, two ways to repent. You can repent out of awe or you can repent out of love. When you repent out of awe, then it takes your, your nasty sins and it makes them less nasty. It rehabilitates some of your sinfulness, but it doesn't wipe it away clean. But when you do tshuva, when you do repentance out of love, it wipes the slate clean. Devoru was capable of that kind of love and she taught the generation to feel that kind of love and to be able to express that kind of love to God. And therefore, everything was wiped clean. And it was a whole new start to this relationship with God. That's what a shira chadash, a new song is. It's a refreshed and revitalized yearning for Hashem and a dedication to Him. And that's the place we have to get to, to be able to sing a shira chadasha, to find our words that allow us to be able to sing this song of connection, the word shiras and the word shir, chains, to make chains of connection between us and God by using our words, by expressing what's inside of us and bringing it out and using it then to create a reality, a God reality. That's what Haggadah means when it says Chayav Adam Liras a person has to see themselves as if they left Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is not a geographic location. Mitzrayim is a state of existence, Mitzorim, straits. It's a place that holds us back and doesn't allow us to be able to express ourselves. It takes away our voice. It holds us back and it doesn't allow us to grow. Every one of us lives in Mitzrayim. Oh, my Mitzrayim is not the same as your Mitzrayim, but we all live in Mitzrayim. Everybody loses their voice at some point. Everybody loses their connection to Hashem and has to find a way to, to gain their voice back, has to find a way to bring it back outside. That's what the Haggadah means, what Rabbi Gamliel means. Call Shalom Omar. Whoever can't get themselves to a point tonight to be able to Omar, to be able to say, to be able to find their words, to be able to express what's going on inside of themselves, to use that to be able to pull themselves out of Mitzrayim, to be able to say, no, you can't hold me back anymore because this is my reality. This is what I want. This is who I am. This is what I want to be. Koshali Omar, whoever can't find their words. Lo Yotzi de has not fulfilled his obligation. What obligation? Chayav Adam Lirais Esatzmai. His obligation to see himself as if he left Mitzrayim. If you can't find your words, you can't get out of Egypt. You won't be able to express yourself and understand yourself enough to be able to climb out of the shackles that tie you down and don't allow you to soar. That's why it says, Behold, Dor Vador, in every single generation. Just because my grandfather was able to climb out of his shackles doesn't mean that I can. And just because I can climb out of my shackles doesn't mean that my son will be able to. Every single generation needs to find their voice, to find their way to create a God reality in their lives. 
And that's what the Seder is all about. About finding our voices to express our love, our appreciation, our connection, our desire for being Jewish and being connected to God. But how do we get our voices back? And that's what Rabbi Gamaliel tells me. Pesach, <clears throat> Matzah, and Marah. What's Pesach? The carbon Pesach, the Paschal Lamb? You know, we were commanded to take the Paschal Lamb, Ares, the god of the Egyptians, the god who was being worshipped in that period of time. And we were told to tie that god of the Egyptians onto our bedposts and to check it for four days to make sure it has no blemishes so that on the 14th, the day before we left Egypt, we could slaughter it, kill it, and eat it in front of the Egyptians. You're talking about asking us to take the God of the people that have been oppressing us for these hundreds of years, to take the God of the people who had, who had beat us who had oppressed us, who had turned us into slaves. Where were we going to find the strength to be able to do that? Where were we going to be able to find the resolve? There were two miracles that happened on that day. That, by the way, is the whole explanation of Shabbos HaGadol. What's the reason it's called Shabbos HaGadol? The big Shabbos, it's not because the rabbi gives a long drush up. It's Shabbos HaGadol because a great miracle happened on that day. And actually it didn't happen on Shabbos, but it's commemorated on Shabbos to give cover to Shabbos and to underscore the, the hugeness of this miracle. One miracle is that none of the Egyptians ever said a word. Nobody complained about it. But the other miracle is, is that we had the conviction and the strength to be able to say, if this is what God wants of me, this is what I'm going to do. And that we didn't cower and that we didn't retreat and that we had the resolve to follow through with what we knew was right. And that's the reason. That's the first thing, says Robin Gamil. You want to get your voice? Stand up for something. Believe in something. Don't shuck and jive. Don't one day believe in this and the next day believe in that identify yourself identify what you live for identify who you live for identify what your values are and then you'll have the strength to be able to verbalize to be able to bring that out you'll find your voice but first you got to find you and that's what the carbon pesach reminded us of the carbon pesach reminds us stand up for what you believe in stand firm and tall in what you believe don't waver. And that's redemption. That's the stuff that redemption is made of. Step two. Matzah. There are many explanations for matzah. Because as I told you, matzah is freedom, matzah is slavery. All Ram and Gamliel wanted to do was to focus on one aspect of matzah, and that was the speed. Matzah has to be made fast. Matzah has to be eaten fast. Matzah has to be eaten before the afikomas, beaten before chatzos. Everything about the matzah is about speed and about being, being fast and having energy. Why is that so critical? So our rabbis tell us, Rishmartem es ha that we have to guard the matzos. And that's the mitzvah of making shmur matzah. We have to make sure that no water touches the wheat so that it doesn't rise, sit like that for 18 minutes, and then eventually become chametz. So Rishmartem es ha you have to guard the matzah, make sure that it doesn't become chametz. Our rabbis look at that and say, that's talking about every single mitzvah in the Torah. Rishmartem es the word matzos, mem tzadi vav tov, also spells the word mitzvos. And our rabbis read it, you have to guard the mitzvos. 
And then our rabbis tell us that because a mitzvah baliotcha, when a mitzvah comes, an opportunity to do a mitzvah comes to your hand, al tach mitzana, don't let it become chametz. Beautiful, don't let it spoil. Don't miss an opportunity. But some of our rabbis look at it and say, wait a second, how can you compare mitzvahs and matzahs? See, by matzahs, if you let it become chametz, it's a whole new entity. It's prohibited on Pesach. It's spoiled. There's something wrong with it. But if you delay doing a mitzvah, you're still doing a mitzvah. Okay, you might not get the full points for it. It might not be as good as, as when you did it on the exact time. The fact that you delayed might be a bad thing, but at the end of the day, you still did the mitzvah. So how can we make a comparison between the two? Because we're making a blunder. We think that the only thing about mitzvahs is getting it done. It's not just about the final outcome. It's about how you get to that final outcome. And how do you get to that final outcome? There has to be a desire. There has to be an energy, an enthusiasm, a fire burning inside of you. A mitzvah baliyotcha, when a mitzvah comes to your hands, al tach mitzvah, don't schlep. Don't say manana, tomorrow, yeah, we'll get it done. It'll get done. I'll do it. Because that denudes it of its essential quality. It doesn't give voice. It doesn't speak to us. It doesn't sing to us. It's got to have desire in it. It's got to have love in it. It's got to have all of that as its basis. And only then can it be brought out and help us create a reality. And that's why Zrizus, that's why action, speed, alacrity is so critical. Because it might not affect the final outcome, but it shows a critical inadequacy when it's not there on the part of the performer. The problem of delaying in Mitzrayim, of staying one more second, was staying one more second. Because that staying one more second meant that we weren't connected. That staying one more second meant that we weren't burning. We didn't, we didn't feel the need, the burn to get out of there, to get to a better place. And that's the travesty. And that, says Rabbi Gamliel, is the second thing you need. Don't delay till tomorrow. Don't schlep. Don't drag your feet. You have resolve? You know who you are? You know what you believe in? Believe in it now. Express it now. Do it now. Because otherwise it'll just dissipate. And just like air, like smoke. And then comes the third component, says Rabbi Gamliel. Mara. Bitter herbs. Endure the pain. I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. The pain is part of the Advaita, it's part of the service, it's part of the whole package. No pain, no gain. Sometimes to get to the greatest places that we get to, we have to be able to endure the pain. We have to be able to accept the pain. We have to recognize this is difficult, it's hard, it's not a simple thing. It hurts like Adam. But that's what allows us to be able to grow. That's what allows us to be able to thrive. And that's the reason why Rabbi Gamliel gave Tame a mitzvah, why he gave the reasons for these mitzvahs. He wasn't giving you the reason of why we eat matzah, the reason of why we eat mar, or the reason of why we eat the carbon Pesach. He was telling you what to focus on when you do it. Because he was telling you what you need in order to be able to get out of your gullus, to be able to get out of, of your Mitzrayim, to be able to get out of the things that shackle you down. He was explaining to us what you need to do in order to be able to find your voice, to use that voice to connect itself to God. You need to have resolve. You need to have an identity. You need to have energy for that. And you need to accept the fact 
that it's not so simple and that there is pain. And that's why Mara is last. Because sometimes, only when we get our voices back can we realize how bitter it really was. See, I could say it's hard, it's bitter. But when I've reconnected myself to God and I feel so buzzed and I feel so connected and I feel great about myself and I feel great about my tyrant, about my Judaism and about my relationship with the Rebbeinu Shlomo, then I can look back and say, boy, I was really in a bad place. Which if I would have just said I was in a bad place, I w there would have been an understatement. Sometimes you can't recognize how bad of a place you were really in until you actually lift yourself back up. That's what Rabbi Gamliel tells us, the Haggadah tells us. Chayev Adam Liro Sesatzmo. Somebody once made a joke and said, how do we know that we have an obligation to bring a mirror to the Seder? A mirror to the Seder? Chayev Adam Liro Sesatzmo. person has to see themselves. No, that's not what's being demanded of us. It's not to be able to see our outer selves, but our obligation is to be able to see our inner selves. You know, we say that Lot was saved from death, the hands of the Snowmites during the war, because when he was with Avram, and Avram said, she's my sister. He didn't open up his mouth and say, that's not his sister, it's his wife. And because he kept quiet, and he was able to protect Avram with his quietness, so then he was saved. That merit saved him later. Our rabbi say, wait a second. He had a lot of merits. That wasn't his only good thing. He was a machnes oreach. He took guests into his house. He was a Baal Chesed, he was a kind person. It was a little messed up, but he was a kind person. He was just like Avram Avinu. So why did he need that special merit? Why didn't that save him? A rabbi say that that wasn't really him. The reason why he was kind was because he learned that from Avram. He was parroting Avram. He was doing what Avram Avinu did. It wasn't an indication of who he really was. The real him was revealed when he kept quiet. That showed his real convictions. I told a beautiful story of Shlom Zam Orbach. He used to dive in a certain minion in the castle. There was a great chazan there. Shlom Zam loved to listen to the chazan. The chazan would sing emotionally. He would cry. He would gesticulate, move his hands. When the chazan died, one of his protégés took over and was exactly like his rabbi. And that's when Rechem Shmuel Levitz started dominating there. Because he said he was exactly like his Rebbe. He cried in the same places. He moved his hands the same way. But it wasn't necessarily coming from the same place. It was coming because of the culture. It was coming because of that's what he learned from his Rebbe. But not necessarily because of his convictions of what was coming deep inside him. The Satmar Rebbe won Purim. One of the badchan, a joker, made a whole play. And he imitated the Satmar Rebbe. He imitated the Satmar Rebbe davening on Yom Kippur with his hand movements and his crying and all of the stuff that the Satmar Rebbe did. And the Satmar Rebbe burst out crying. And he said that just like this guy, he's just putting on a show. Maybe that's what I'm doing also. Because the importance of seeing ourselves on Pesach night, Chayavadam Liro says Atzmo, is not to see ourselves with a mirror, but to honestly soul search and to see if we are really involved, to check ourselves out and to test ourselves. Are we really involved in our Vodas Hashem in the service of God? Or is it only an imitation of the real thing? We have to see ourselves. We have to identify ourselves. 
We have to know who the real us is. And then we can leave our mitzvahim. And then we can find our voices. And you know what happens when you're successful? Look at the next words in the Haggadah. Lefikach. It comes naturally. Therefore, we will sing and praise. Because once we find our voices, we feel that desire to connect. It just pours out of us. And that's why it's in this section. Because getting back our voices is itself a praise of Hashem. There's another person that is able to recognize where he's from, what he is, who he needs to be connected to. That's what we're meant to achieve on Pesach night. That realization of who we really are. When we go through the Haggadah, people go nuts. We read the Haggadah and it's boring. And we try to have these discussions that are equally as boring. And we sometimes say over things that are boring. And it's not, it's about the soul. It's about finding our voices, about identifying with our children, with our grandchildren, with our guests, with our friends, with our relatives, sitting around the table and trying to identify what holds us back. Where are our Jewish voices? That's what I'm meant to be doing at the Seder. Not just singing songs, not just saying words but finding out who we really are. What do we really believe in? What do we really aspire to become? Because when we find our voices, when we find that ability to take our insides and connect them to God, to create that God reality in our lives, then we'll be able to sing the Shira Chadasha a rejuvenated, beautiful, amazing new song. A song that celebrates not just our redemption, but celebrates the redemption of our world. Everybody should have a beautiful, awesome, incredible, amazing Pesach. And we should merit pulling ourselves out of our own dirt, finding our voices, and letting our voices sing. Have a beautiful Yontif.